London news agents. There is a budget coming in October. And it's going to be painful. We have no other choice given the situation that we're in. Those with the broadest shoulders should bear the heavier burden. Although Oasis might be back together. Oh, you b****! That's the line I was going to use. <laughs> We're not on a bit of a come down from the DNC, are we? Are we? By any chance? As I was saying, although Oasis might be back together, if there were any clearer sign that it ain't 1997 anymore, Dorothy, it was Keir Starmer giving his first major speech in the Downing Street Rose Garden this morning, where his message to the electorate was, despite the fact that we have a majority of 100 and 70 seats. The Labour government is going to oversee, at least for a time, a period where things aren't going to get better. They will get worse. Yes. And you go back to the Oasis period. And of course, Labour's song in 97 was things can only get better. It was downbeat. It was depressing, actually. It was gloom mongering. Are things really as bad as Keir Starmer says they are? Not so much cool Britannia as gruel Britannia. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a pro. He always gets there in the end. Welcome to the news agents, even though I have to suffer, Lewis Goodall. It's John. It's a very offended Lewis. It and... took 30 seconds before you swore at me in this new <laughs> week. 30 I mean, seconds, if that. <laughs> in this podcast, we said we would take you behind the curtain. Frankly, we've taken you into the dressing room and the locker room for some chat that really shouldn't have been put out. But anyway, I don't know editor, much about our I, Edison knows better. I don't know much about football, but I, I think that there must be dressing rooms of, of Premier League football clubs that have better language and less and more respect for each other <laughs> than this bloody studio. But there we go. Here we are. But anyway, so Keir Starmer gave this much vaunted speech. And I kind of think there's, I think probably both of us, I'll, I dare to speak for Lewis, that we are quite on amicable terms, really. There's a bit of whip quite after the DNC, which was so kind of almost absurdly upbeat, optimistic, feel good, to a speech in the Rose Garden, which was just pure feel bad about the state of Britain, about what the Labour Party has inherited, about how difficult it is to do anything about any of the problems that Britain now faces and it's going to take 10 years of misery before we might might start to smile again. And it just seems such a kind of gla glaring contrast to what we had last week in Chicago. Yeah, I mean, it was a profound, profound difference. Um, and I don't know whether that was just the balloons and the ticker tape, but it's always the case that American political culture um, is uh, generally more sort of Panglossian and optimistic in tone than, than British politics. But it was a glaring difference that we might talk about a little bit more in terms of Starmer's future. But in terms of taking a step back and thinking, what was Starmer trying to do? I mean, this was, I mean, it seems extraordinary, really, considering he's nearly two months in. But this was his first major speech, apart from on the door of Downing Street on July the 5th that he's made. And obviously a lot has happened since then, not least the riots, far right riots that, that we saw in Britain a few weeks ago. And Starmer, I think, was trying to do a few things. He was trying to set the terms of politics. And it was a very political speech, highly political, to the point, actually, you almost wondered whether it was appropriate doing it in the Downing Street because there was no policy to it at all. It was pure politics. And he was setting the sort of tone and the prism through which he wants us to see politics in the next few months. And it was building on themes that he's already established, which is naturally you would expect with a new government, blaming the Tories for the woes that Britain has. He was threading a narrative, adding to that narrative, stuff about the riots, saying that um, Britain and the British state was less capable than it should have been, or it had been in 2011, for example, when he was director of public prosecutions in dealing with the riots. Again, as a result, he says, of Tory fecklessness. And he was trying to prepare us for a budget which is clearly, as he said in his words, going to be painful. That builds on what Rachel Reeves told you and Emily a month or so ago, where she said that there would be tax rises. And this was, therefore, an attempt, as I say, to sort of set the terms of political trade for the next few months going up to Christmas. I think what I would say that was good about it is the manner in which he was trying to frame political debate, which is to get away from the populism that has infected British politics over the past seven, eight years, I mean, since Brexit, frankly, when the default position has been to say, it's easy. Ah, oh, 
you know, we'll get Brexit done and everything will be better. To use your word, Panglossian, this sense that it's just there are easy solutions to difficult problems. We can do it. Don't you worry. The boosterism of Boris Johnson. I think it was Voltaire's word. Which was... <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, just from the boosterism of Boris Johnson, we've now got someone who's saying, you know what, life is complicated. And I kind of have long thought that actually on a whole range of issues, there needs to be a more grown up debate. I mean, immigration being the yeah. classic one where you want to say, yeah, illegal immigration, bloody awful. It's got to be stopped. But a lot of immigration is actually contributing to the British economy and to the, the well-being uh, of the country. Um, and if Keir Starmer wants to frame the debate in that way, then fine. I would thought it was very interesting that he said the people with the broader shoulders have to bear the burden more. And I kind of immediately thought, well, is he going to break one of the election pledges, which is that there'll be no increase in income tax, national insurance or VAT? I mean, the easiest way to make those with the broader shoulders bear more of the burden is to increase the top rate of tax for people earning over wherever you choose to set the market, 150,000, 200,000, whatever you happen to do. But I don't think he's going to do that. So it's worth kind of considering, I think, for a minute, what he might have in mind if his words are to be taken seriously on that. It's clear that he and Rachel Reeves are now considering a whole range of different potential tax changes the difficulty with that, as you say, John, is that they've excluded the three main levers through which you will raise significant revenue, which is income tax, VAT, national insurance. So what does that leave you with? I think it's very likely we're going to see a change on capital gains tax. I think it's very likely that we'll see changes in the way the state deals with pensions and taxes pensions. Perhaps there'll be a form of extra wealth taxation on the table, maybe some changes in inheritance tax. The difficulty is, as I say, these are all things that raise some money, but not loads of money. And what Starmer is saying, I mean, obviously, there's a political problem here as well. That's the policy problem. How do you actually raise the money to the, the political problem is that, of course, Labour in the election not only ruled out those things, but said that they had no plans to increase taxation. Now, of course, as we said at the time, and, and everyone would say, when a politician says they have no plans to do something, don't think that precludes them from doing it. It just means they're not planning to do it at that exact moment. But it is a political problem in the sense that the Conservatives, you know, ran their entire election campaign on the premise that Labour would increase taxes. And indeed, it seems that despite denying it at the time, Labour are, are going to do that. And they're doing it for a very specific reason, which is an interesting one, right? Which is that Starmer and, and Reeves are claiming that the reason they're having to do this is because the situation with the public finances and the British sort of state more generally is even worse than they thought that it would be. And so we have to think about whether that's accurate, right? Now, I think it is true up to a point in the sense that we know, as was covered at the time, that the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, did not know about some of the overspends that Rachel Reeves has described in the last month or so, which are quite significant and are going to put a significant strain on the public finances. So that's true as far as it goes. I think it is difficult for Labour to say, though, that they wouldn't have had a good idea of the overall contours of not only the state of the public finances, but the economy overall, right, or the public state, the state overall. Because actually, you can argue that Labour coming into government had a better idea of these things than any incoming government before. Why? Well, because they did have the OBR. I mean, previously, incoming governments would only have treasury statistics to rely on, which were often doctored. That was the whole point the OBR was set up by George Osborne in the first place. So they definitely had a better, although probably imperfect, idea of where they were going. And in terms of the economy and the British state overall, the Labour Party had been arguing for certainly under the whole period of the Starmer leadership and before that, that basically was Britain was on its knees. So it is hard to kind of, it's hard to sustain the idea that they believed it was that much worse or found it that much worse than they believed it was going to be. Well, I think the other thing that was said by um, Keir Starmer in this speech today was to talk about the values that marked the Conservative administration and the values that uh, will mark his administration. He did this in the Rose Garden and he made reference to that particular location as a way of drawing a contrast. This is a government for you. A garden and a building that were once used for lockdown parties. Remember the pictures just over there of the wine and the food? Well, this garden and this building are now back in your service. It's not 
just that the last government relied on easy gimmicks and bad ideas. Those things happened precisely because the government itself lost its focus on the hopes and ambitions of working people. See, I think there is a really big problem that needs to be tackled at the heart of our politics if it's to regain the legitimacy and the support of the people. And that is for voters to think that actually they do have confidence in what politicians are doing, that this lot is different from the last lot, not that, oh, bloody hell, they're all the same. And, I mean, it's very early days in this administration, but there are one or two little things that have happened which I think people are right to arch an eyebrow about. I mean, the fact that Wahid Ali, you know, we're talking about Cool Britannia, who was one of Blair's people back in the 1990s, you know, had this pass to get into Downing Street, which apparently has now been revoked, that a senior civil servant was appointed at the Treasury, someone who had previously given money to uh, Rachel Reeves. Now, I happen to know the person involved and I spoke to a senior Treasury person who said, look, he is absolutely what the Treasury needs. We need somebody who knows about business, who knows about the outside world, who has worked in those worlds. But the question is, does it pass the smell test of saying, well, hang on, what, someone who's given to Rachel Reeves private office when she was campaigning to be Chancellor? is now appointed as senior civil servant. In America, no one would bat an eyelid because American politics is so much more transactional. But that's not the way we do things here. And I think that Starmer has to be careful that those sort of things don't lead to a narrative from the Tories of saying, actually, Labour, you're no different from us and you were just stinking hypocrites when you called us out on this stuff. I think there's two things about that that Labour think, right? One is that um, some of the people of... I mean, Starmer, when he was asked about this, basically replied with this, that he was going to take no lectures from these people who overall saw this, this cronyism. I mean, some of the people who are calling this out most volubly online, I have to say, are some of the most significant hypocrites <laughs> going because they were people who we know oversaw in lots of ways the politicisation of the civil service um, and who were, uh, you know, involved in all sorts of ways with, with cronyism. That doesn't excuse it. But what it does do is it explains this cycle, which is Labour see it wherein they're in their opposition. And then they think they attach themselves, they get the levers of power, and they say, well, now we're in office and we get the spoils of power and we get to give these jobs to our friends. That That is how it has worked. That doesn't excuse it at all. It shouldn't work that way. But I think it's fair to say that the Conservatives, who did not, let's say, have an unblemished record with regards to cronyism or with regards to, let's say, the propriety in the public realm, necessarily have the highest pedestal on which to stand. That is what Labour think. The second thing that they think is that, um, much as the Conservatives used to say when these issues come up, that the public overall don't care about this stuff, that they just don't notice. It's just noise, which is probably true. Again, it doesn't excuse it or make it right or excuse impropriety if that has happened or is perceived to have happened. But that is what they think. The other thing I felt about listening to Starmer today was a sort of, I hesitate to use the word, but of helplessness and haplessness that what can we do? I mean, what can I do? It, it, it is what it is. And you're the prime minister of the country. Now, that doesn't mean you're all mighty and all powerful and omniscient. But you do have quite a lot of levers you can still pull as the prime minister of a country. For a start, you could raise fuel duty. It hasn't been raised since 2010. Probably about 40 to 60 billion pounds of lost revenue in that, in that time. If you're looking for 20, 20 billion, you could do that as a stroke. Now, they don't want to do it for politi political reasons, but that is just one example of, of what you're talking about, John, which is a government which has a, is overseeing a two to three trillion pound economy is never powerless. And I think there is a, a real danger for Labour and for Starmer. There, there, is a diff there is a fine line, I think, between smashing the Tories and appearing powerless, right? I mean, what is clear is that Labour are learning and have at the centre of their mind George Osborne and Osbornism, right? George Osborne in 2010 was extremely successful in laying the foundations for a political strategy which worked for years, which was to blame Labour for all of the difficult things they were to do. That could well work as a political strategy. The question is, does it work long term as a policy remedy, right? In the sense that one of the differences between, there's always been, and this goes to the, one of the contradictions or the paradoxes of Starmerism, I think. 
and it's always been there, which is that Starmer has always ha had two contentions. One is that, as we've already said, the British state is on its knees and the state of the economy, the state of British society all needs transformation. He talks really big, but there's a danger that he acts small, right? There is a mismatch and there always has been between the, the diagnosis and the prescription. Because what is Starmer saying he's done in the first seven weeks with a majority of 170? And okay, we've had the summer recess, so we're still in very early days. But you know, he's talking about planning reform. He's talking about great British energy. He's talking about a sovereign wealth fund, all laudable things in their own different ways. Does it over the long term really shift the dial in terms of the shape of the British economy and the model that we have? I'm not sure that it does. And so you need to, if, if, if your diagnosis is right, which is that you need transformation in the public services and you need transformation of the British economic model, which has always been the sort of Starmer contention, then you need some really big prescriptions, really big ideas for how to do it. And it isn't really clear, despite that big majority, that they're there. And because at the moment, indeed, what Starmer is doing is basically, as I say, recycling the kind of, you know, Osbornism. But the difference was as well that George Osborne believed that lower investment or less money for public services not only could, but would make them more efficient, would make them better. Labour doesn't, no one in the Labour Party really believes that. So there is a mismatch between the political strategy that they're adopting, which is basically Osbornism, and actually the kind of long-term remedies that the Labour Party thinks the economy and the British state needs. And I think sooner or later, that is going to run out of road or become a contradiction that looms larger in the, in the way this government is perceived. I suppose the simpler point is that you wonder how much, how, how big is the window for blaming the Conservatives for everything? How much longer can you keep saying, well, we wouldn't have to do this if the Tories hadn't left it in such a mess? Well, we would have been able to do this if only there was more money left in the in the kitty. And it was interesting, I thought that, you know, while Sosborne used to say we're going to fix the roof while the sun shines, which I think is a phrase that goes back to John F. Kennedy, uh, you had him today say we're repairing the foundations of the house it's not just the roof that's a bit leaky the whole bloody thing is crumbling and therefore we've got to do the foundations and you just think that there must be a time where you say okay we've been the government now for x number of months years we take responsibility for it and i don't think that it felt like this was a speech that was still in campaigning mode yes I think rather right. than we are now the government i think they think and maybe as i say this is true that, you know, the blame the Tory element, I mean, it could last years. I mean, it did for Osborne. Although, of course, there is a there is a difference with the Labour government, which is that the Conservatives have the, much of the press on their side. That is a line that the Daily Mail, the Sun and others will happily kind of regurgitate sort of day after day, which influences the way the whole media thinks about it. Labour will have far less of that with, with the Conservative su supporting press. I think there's another thing which I thought about it, though, which is I think if you're a voter and you're listening to Starmer today, and you're hearing that things are going to get worse before they get better, you would be forgiven for thinking, bloody hell. I can't remember a time when a politician said things were going to get better, virtually. Perhaps with the exception of the boosterism of Boris Johnson, although maybe that's part of the reason it was successful, albeit for a short time. You can argue we have had, again, 14 years of Osbonite kind of political strategy, that constant talk of pessimism before at some point things will get better in, in, the, in the longer term. And I just don't know how much bandwidth the country still has for that for constantly hearing that kind of doom i mean ernie bevin obviously one of the great figures of, of, of labor history who was foreign secretary and minister of labor during the war he once said that he hoped to be the minister of labor until 1990 and obviously he didn't mean that literally he meant that he would have a political strategy and transform industrial relations in the country during the second world war which would last for half a century sometimes it feels like george osborne is going to be chancellor until 2050. That, that there has not been a chancellor or prime minister who have had the sort of political now or strategy to move away from the way he thought about politics and the economy. And yet it is clear that in so many ways, Osbornism, austerity, kind of that kind of political strategy, in so many ways has failed. And yet for lots of reasons, some structural, some political, some I think through sheer lack of imagination, Prime Minister and Chancellor, including even this Labour one or this Labour pair, keep finding themselves pulled back into the orbit of it. 
And I just think that for a Labour government and, you know, that strategy, for a Labour government, this is predicated on the idea that we will get re-elected and see off the forces of populism through improvements to the public services. I think Osbornism, Osbornism as a strategy will only take you so far and it will need far greater imagination from the heart of the Labour government to think, how are we actually going to improve the public realm and think big and translate that into a politics which resonates? Because, as I say, this will get them so far, I don't think it will get them that far. You know, it's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, look, we said in the introduction about the kind of oasis thing, and it takes you back to 1997 and Cool Britannia. One of the things that I've heard from a lot of the people who were the architects of New Labour when they look at Keir Starmer, now no one can take away the majority that he won in the general election and he's the first person to win a Labour majority since Tony Blair did in 1997, is the lack of ambition, is exactly what you're saying. Not just a lack of ambition, but also a lack of thought about what are our big ideas? How do we see the future of the British state? What exactly. is the relationship between the state and the economy and what the public services should be and growth in the economy? And how do we set the balance on taxation so that we are encouraging entrepreneurialism, uh, but we're still looking after the most vulnerable in society? And on that, you just get a slight sense that they don't want to address big fundamental questions. You know, Tony Blair at the end was talking about how the forces of conservatism with a small C, you know, he had the scars on his back from trying to change things in the way the relationship between various bits of the British state. And it looks like Keir Starmer doesn't want to go there. I think that's quite intrinsic to him, actually. I, I think he, you compare him with someone like Ed Miliband, for example, who was very interested in ideas and Tony Blair as well, you know, very interested in sort of big picture ideas, abstraction. It's not how he thinks. He considers himself a sort of fixer and um, is suspicious of these big kind of programmatic kind of visions of, of politics. But again, that's why I think there is a mismatch, because on the one hand, he is talking about these massive kind of problems that Britain and the British state has, whilst coming up with ideas, ideas which seem small by comparison, particularly when you consider he has a majority of 170. He can do what he wants. He's the king of British politics right now. When you've got a majority of 170, you can pretty much do anything that you want to do. So there is a tension between basically talking about all of the things that you can't do and all of the constraints that you have, some of which are real, of course, and the fact that in terms of political space, if he wanted to, he could push British politics in any direction he chooses. We will be back after the break with some of the practical measures that actually Keir Starmer is thinking about of reform within the Labour Party. So as discussed, Keir Starmer obviously wants to draw a contrast between how he will govern and how the Tories governed. And one of the things he's apparently looking at right now is changing the rules by which you change a party leader when the party leader is also the prime minister. Uh, brackets. Remember Liz Truss? Close brackets. The fact of the matter was that the Tory membership chose Liz Truss to be the prime minister even though she couldn't muster the support of half of her MPs. And so Keir Starmer is looking at changing the rules by which Labour will elect a leader. And it obviously looks like self-interest if you're going to make it harder to depose the Prime Minister. Uh, who's the Prime Minister? Oh, it's Keir Starmer. Um, but there is a sort of sense in which I think actually it makes, you know, there's logic to it. Yeah, I mean, people forget now that, you know, this would actually be a reversion to what was the historic the norm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Before uh, the 1980s in the Labour Party's case and the early 21st century, 2001, in the Conservative Party's case, it was only the MPs on both sides who would choose who the leader was. So, for example, when Jim Callaghan took over from Harold Wilson, it didn't go to the party members. It went to... The PLP, the, the Parliamentary Labour Party. And likewise, when John Major took over from Margaret Thatcher in 1990, it was it was Conservative uh, MPs. And it was only, as I say, in the 80s in Labour's case and in 2001 for the Tories that this idea of the importance of internal party democracy came to be seen as very, very important, i.e. that you would have Labour members or trade unions, as it was in that case, choosing a leader. And this this obviously reached, in the Labour Party's case, reached its kind of climax in 2014-15, because there used to be, in the Labour Party's case, 
what used to be called the Electoral College, i.e. a third of the votes for leader went to the membership, a third went to the trade unions, and a third went to the PLP. Um, that was changed by Ed Miliband in 2014-15 to make it one member, one vote, which, totally inadvertently, no one saw it coming, led to the election of Jeremy Corbyn. And as far as Keir Starmer current proposals or ideas and thinking are concerned when they're talking about a Liz Truss lock of course what they probably really mean is a Jeremy Corbyn lock i.e. The, the Starmer project has always been as much about the country as about the Labour Party and it has always been about the right of the Labour Party ensuring that the near-death experience as far as they're concerned of a left-wing takeover of the Labour Party which so nearly reached fruition never ever happens again and so I'm not surprised at all that they're coming up with this idea. Whether it passes Labour Party conference, I think, is another matter entirely, because I do not see the unions, particularly some of the more left wing unions, going for this idea, because they would see it as a dilution of their power. This is one of the reasons why the changes in the 80s were brought about in the first place. They would see it as a dilution of their power to influence who the Labour leader or Prime Minister was going to be. But then it's a really interesting political calculation that Keir Starmer has to make. Look, just before the break, Lewis, you were saying uh, the thing about Keir Starmer is he's king right now. He can do whatever he likes. He's got a majority of 170. If he comes forward with a proposal that he then fails to get through a Labour Party conference, yeah. he looks very much less king-like. He looks like a man who's there in title, in office, but not in power. If he can't get his own party to agree a rule change... Uh, like that. Do you think this is just flying a kite I think, and seeing which, how the wind is blowing? I think there are elements of the Labour Party on the right of the Labour Party and doubtless around Starmer who would love to do it. But I mean, you need some... It hasn't been floated before and you need some pretty serious political legwork to get this done within the Labour Party because you have to... It's not like the Conservative Party where the Conservative leader can just basically do things by diktat more or less. There are some processes. But, you know, the Labour Party, you have to square off all the, the unions, competing... Yeah, yeah, you know, it's PRPs, like you go to the Labour yeah, Party conference, CLPs. you're discussing Composite 14, subsection 3. You know, like it is a Byzantine bureaucratic process. You have to square everybody off. So although there are lots of elements of the Labour Party that would dearly like to do it, it would be a big risk. Conversely, if you really are serious about doing it, as you say, John, in terms of the political dynamics, this would be the time to do it whilst his authority is greatest. He's just won this 170 majority. I mean, leaving aside the, the, the practicalities of it, I mean, just philosophically, constitutionally, I mean, I think it would be a good idea just for the pure constitutionality of it. It was always sat awkwardly within the British Constitution that you could have a situation where the prime minister, who, remember, is supposed to be the man or woman who can command a majority, command the confidence of the House of Commons, could theoretically be installed by 100,000, 200,000, maybe half a million of the people in the Labour Party's case, people in the country who have nothing to do with the House of Commons but are connected with the Labour or Conservative parties. And that has undoubtedly led to instability within the British Constitution in recent years. We saw that reach its climax with the Labour Party in, in 2016. You remember when, just after the Brexit referendum, Jeremy Corbyn was perceived by Labour MPs, He's, rightly yeah. or wrongly, to have failed the party and failed the Remain campaign and expressed a motion of no confidence. Overwhelmingly, I can't remember the exact margin, but I think it was, you know, 170 Labour MPs, something like that. He said, no, I'm staying on because I don't get my authority from you. I get it from the membership within the party. Now, that was just ended up being sitting completely awkwardly, i.e. you had a clash between internal Labour Party democracy and our parliamentary democracy, because, again, the leader of the Labour Party or the leader of the opposition is supposed to be the person who commands the support of the biggest group in opposition. And it just led to instability. Likewise with Liz Truss. She did not get exactly. a majority of Conservative MPs, but she was put there by the membership. So it always, I mean, she would often talk about, wouldn't she? No one was respecting my mandate. Liz what, Truss, what mandate? What mandate? Who you got a you mandate, mandate from like 60,000 people in the Conservative Party in the country. So what? I also do think that in the political instability that we saw in 2022 and that carried on and contributed towards the Conservatives' massive defeat uh, in July was not just the 49 days of Liz Truss's premiership, awful though that was, it was as much to do with the mechanism by which she was elected, which I think gave such a sense of a democratic deficit that the British people had been shut out again from who the prime minister should be. And I just think the British people thought this is ridiculous. And how is it that less than half of the available Conservative Party membership voted for her? Because, you know, a lot of people abstained or didn't bother to fill in their forms. So she got less than half 
of the Conservative Party membership voting for her and she's the new Prime Minister. And I just think it gave this sense that something is rotten. So for you know for Keir Starmer to do something about it so that it's not just a bunch of hacks and activists who are choosing but at least they are the representatives in parliament then that makes total sense well they also know these people I mean that was the whole point about Liz Truss for example yeah. a lot of Conservative MPs would say you know if we'd had the choice we wouldn't have, we yeah. wouldn't have voted for it because we knew her yeah. we knew how mad she was and, and, and how swivel eyed she was but of course even the membership in the country don't know her in the same way and let's not forget who the membership are either, right? These are people who've just paid a few quid, yeah. or five or a month or whatever it is, to basically have a vote. I mean, again, that's not very democratic. When you can basically choose to pay into a system, it's like the old rotten boroughs. You can basically pay to have a vote in one form or another. That's not very democratic. i say one, one thing for Keir Starmer, though. He may, if he does do it, he may have cause to regret it. This was actually quite a helpful system for party leaders in one sense, which is that if you were in trouble, Particularly if you're the prime minister, it's less of a problem if you're in opposition. But if if you're the, if you're the prime minister, one sort of ace you could have up your sleeve was to say, "Well, we can't possibly have a leadership election. It'll take months because it'll have to go to the membership. You know, we'll plunge the country into chaos." You really think that would be a good idea right now? We're at twenty points in the polls or twenty-five points in the polls. You think that would be a good idea? Although it didn't work so well in the end for Boris Johnson or, or Liz Truss, it did enhance their power because that was something they were able to say. If you go back to a system where basically the PLP can get rid of you and then replace you in a week, which is what happened to Margaret Thatcher, of course, Prime Minister who had been there for 11 and a half years, gone in a week because of a vote of Conservative MPs at, at that time. I it does empower, it well. I'm sure you do, it does empower your MPs because you are getting, you are, again, you're, you're centering all of your authority and your legitimacy, rightly, but potentially problematically, with your MPs rather than the mandate you receive from the party at large. We will be back in a moment with a bit of Cool Britannia and Oasis. And the best British group is Oasis. It's a hat trick of Brits, of course, for Oasis. Uh, best video, best album, and now best British group. And um, how are they going to celebrate? Is there any wonder? We've not got a lot to say tonight, but at the end of the day, like, it's all a fake this thing, right? We knew we were going to do it anyway. So um, that is it. Can I say hello? Hello, Mum and Dad. Oi! There are seven people in this room tonight who are giving a little bit of hope to young people in this country. That is me, our kid, Bonehead, Quigsy, Alan White. Alan McGee and Tony Blair. And if you've all got anything about you, you get up there and you shake Tony Blair's hand, man. He's a man. Power to the people! So that was Noel Gallagher speaking in 1996, um, encouraging people to vote for that priest of high cool, Tony Blair, because he was going to do something about young people. And of course, this was um, part of the kind of phenomenon at that time, which became known in retrospect, I think it was a Time magazine cover that dubbed it Cool Britannia. And it kind of reached its climax that period when Tony Blair, shortly after becoming prime minister, invited so many of the kind of denizens of cool Britain and arts and culture into Downing Street to celebrate all of this. And I've just found out that the coolest of them all uh -huh. was there. And that was John Sopel. Well, I wasn't in night. Downing Street at that party, but I was at the 1996 Brit Awards. Oh, right, even cool. You were too cool for the 97 party. I mean, I've, been able got, to get no, you. I've been there, done it. But yeah, it was a really extraordinary period. Um, it was a period of great optimism. And I think it was also partly a coming up to the millennium and a new start. And, you know, Blair would be the face of this kind of new millennium starting. And Blair really loved it. And it worked very well for him that he wanted to be with sports stars. I mean, I remember him doing heading tennis with Kevin Keegan. And actually, did it pretty bloody well. When Blair went to the White House on his first trip at the beginning of 1998, uh, I was on that trip. And, you know, he was giving a Lifetime Achievement Award to Elton John in the White House. And they didn't... Well, have Blair that. did? Yeah. 
Really? They did, they hadn't organised the film crew. Actually, if you want the full story on this, they hadn't organised the film crew. They asked to borrow ours. So I went along to film this clip of Blair giving the Lifetime Achievement Award to Elton John. In the White House. In the White House. And you had like one he's the end, president. <laughs> and you had at one end of the room, Bill Clinton watching. And at the other end of the room, not acknowledging the president, Hillary Clinton, because this was the height of the Monica Lewinsky mm. affair. And it was just painful. And your Sorry, eyes were Hills. darting Sorry. from one end of the room to the other. As uh, Sorry seems to be the hardest word. Yeah, exactly. As, as uh, Blair gave this award to Elton John. But that is what Blair kind of lent into. And it worked very well for him, you know, in the first two or three years. And he seemed pretty untouchable at that point. The Millennium Dome didn't work so well. No. When he, they were all singing Old Lang Syne with the Queen. Well, we've gone full cycle now, as we were saying at the... Or full circle, uh, with the... Um, as we were saying at the top of the show, because Oasis are back together. Are you excited, John? Yeah, I am. I'd, I'd honestly really love to get tickets. Do you think any politician could recreate that now? Sort of cool Britannia sense? Or do you think it was unique to that I think it, I think it was... I think there's too much cynicism. Yeah. I think that it would be very hard to lean into that. But politicians still try. I mean, for goodness sake, Look you know, Kamala we, we had Kamala Harris last week yeah. where, you know, we were thinking, is Taylor Swift going to turn up? Is Beyonce going to turn up? And it was up? credible. They could I mean, they didn't alas. They didn't, but, they didn't um, alas. But there were plenty of people who were quite cool about around American sport and American media and American arts who will lean into the Kamala Harris campaign. Yeah, in a way that they never would have done with Biden. Because he just didn't have the vibes for it, right? And in a way that Keir Starmer didn't use any. There was no. It wasn't a celeb no. campaign in July, was it? I no. mean, he wasn't leaning heavily I, on those I, sort of people. To sort of circle back to sort of where we started, I do think that. Um, I mean, it's it's difficult because I am aware, you, as you say, John, you allude to. We do live in a very cynical age, and I've sat in enough focus groups and talked to enough voters to know that. Um, and so, I kind of like get the Starmer approach and his team's approach to, you know, promise little and try and over deliver. So I get all that, but there is something in me nonetheless that still believes on some level that the electorate does yearn or does want some sense of forward momentum of some optimism and that they will in some sense that will resonate with people as we are seeing at least to some extent Harris try and do. I mean, Harris is making this bet and we saw that all of last week. She is making a bet that the Democrats can be as they kept referring to themselves, happy warriors that they can kind of thread together a political narrative based around optimism and contrasting it with Trump's deep, deep pessimism about the sort of country that America has been and is and is likely going to be. And it does feel really jarring with everything that, that we heard today. And yes, Starmer is in government. And it's a completely different sort of set of political contours. But it does feel that there, there could be and probably should be some infusion of optimism and a happy medium, or at least a kind of moving of the notches to try and give that sense of momentum in British politics, because we have not had it for such a long time. I mean, that is the Harris bet, right? The bet is, is that you can still motivate people with hope and optimism. That is an empty space in British politics right now and has been for a very long time. When I was in America, some of you say, what, what's the food like? And I'd say, well, the sweet food is sweeter and the salty food is saltier because they put so much more sweeteners into things. And I thought that at the Democrats last week, it was so sweet. There was so much sweetness in it. Saccharine almost. That, that you would never get away with that in British politics. But by God, we could learn something mm. about the upbeat nature, about rallying cry, about things can get better um, in the way that we do our politics and the way that we sell our message about who we are and what we are as a country. On that uplifting note, I'm yeah. voting Sopel. We'll be back tomorrow. See you then. Bye. 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 The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 